Welcome into the Michigan Football Report. We have got our Instagram Q&A. So those of you following on Instagram, those of you that submitted questions this week, thanks a lot. You see the IG account there below the screen, at Michigan Football Report. We're trying to make it simple for you guys. Go ahead and follow. You can get your question on next week's show. Let's take a look at today's first question from Mason Robel. Well, is that how you pronounce it? Robel? Probably a Robel. Do we have a chance against Ohio State, or is the team getting our hopes up? The perception of Michigan has certainly changed over the past few weeks, even in the loss against Penn State. People got excited about the offense. You crushed Notre Dame. And, frankly, you go on the road and win against a mediocre Maryland team. And then hopes fly eternal with Don Brown chatting Don. Another year, a different group. Wait, you're talking about it's a, it's a different group and a better year than the team that lost two first, two top 15 picks uh, in the draft and Maybe your best defensive lineman in a decade and Chase Winovich and also a third-round cornerback and David Long. You think it's a better – you're going to say it's a new year, Don? I think you lost a lot of talent. So it's a two-week day street. Our guys will be ready. This reminds me so much of last year when the revenge tour became this big storyline. And I'll admit it, it was fun. You got your wins against Wisconsin and Michigan State and Penn State in three straight games, all top 15 teams, I believe, at the time. But then you go to Ohio State and you start uh, Zach Gentry and Karan Higdon guaranteeing the victory on the podium the Monday before the game, which was uh, certainly seemed fun at the time, but we don't actually play. You don't have a, uh, a defensive game plan to stop at any level Ohio State. And you're looking at now, you know, four, four straight losses to the Buckeyes will be a fifth this year, which frankly, it could be a mirage, this Ohio State team. I don't know, but I don't know. In, let's just say the last 20 years, I don't think there's ever been an Ohio State team that's been this impressive every single game like this Ohio State team has. So I think you're getting your hopes up, frankly. I don't expect Michigan to win, but if you would have told me Jim Harbaugh started 0-5 against Ohio State, I would have said you're mentally insane five years ago. So you never know, but I wouldn't get my hopes up that Michigan is going to beat the Ohio State Buckeyes. Question coming in from Corey Novak at underscore Novak or Novak underscore C30. We've been running the ball better lately. Has Harbaugh taken more control over the O? Well, you saw my show last week, and let me just say this. I've been put in my place by those inside the program that says that's probably not the case. Michigan's running the same plays, the same playbooks as Josh Gash ran at Alabama or was part of running at Alabama last year, but the running game has gotten better, Corey. And maybe that's just the team finally understanding the concepts. Maybe the RPO game is, is a little bit uh, more efficient. Or, which is what I've seen, is that Michigan hasn't done as many of runs out of what's called an RPO, where the linemen aren't 100% sure if they're running blocking, although they'll start run blocking, or if they're going to pass block. But the emergence of Hassan Haskins has certainly helped. The first six games, mediocre on the ground. The last three, a lot better. In two games against the three, you know, two of the three games are against two of the three best teams you've played all year, you know, plus Wisconsin to, the, to date. So certainly the running game's gotten better. I'm going to, uh, at this point, probably say it's more on the burns of Hassan Haskins and the scaling back of what we call the RPO runs and just go to more true runs out of the shotgun, some of the, 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 the trap plays, some of the, uh, the pulls with the guards. Plays that look a lot like last year, but if you look at Alabama's film last year in 2018, they were running the same kind of stuff. But that's the question from Corey Novak. Guys, make sure to get going with the Action Network. We got the 40% deal for you. Nobody else has this deal. Chatsports.com slash deal. 40% off of the Action Network. It's normally 10 bucks a month. You'll get it for $5.99. You will be the smartest guy in the room when it comes to trends and stats around sports. When it comes to betting, you'll know your know, team's doing good in the road, doing bad in the road, and where the public and the big-time smart bettors are putting their money. 40% off using chatsports.com slash deal with the Action Network. Next question coming in from Cameron, MM Analyst on Instagram. Do you think DPJ, Nico Collins, and Tariq Black would stay for 2020 to increase their draft stock? Well, they certainly should because if I was an NFL GM – turned out all the offers, but if I took any of those job offers, I wouldn't draft any of these guys. I might draft Ronnie Bell. I certainly wouldn't draft Nico Collins, Tweet Black, or Donovan Peoples-Jones based on the production they put up in Michigan. When you guys got guys all over the country putting up 1,000 and 1,200 and 1,400 yard, uh, yards receiving, and 
You'll see a couple more questions coming up here later in this show or tomorrow's mailbag about Shea Patterson being the reason for these stats. But let's scale it back there for a second. I don't, Shea's not had the season I thought he would, and that's, that's fine. And he's certainly not an all Big Ten quarterback this year. But you go back to Ole Miss, uh, you know, they had A.J. Brown had like 1,300 yards in 2017. And um, what's the guy's name from the Seahawks? DK Metcalf, they say, you know, he didn't have a thousand yards. But he certainly had a lot better stats than Treat Black, Nico Collins, and them were. And I'll say another thing: Michigan went from like '97 to 2007. It was like 10 straight years with a thousand-yard receiver, and those were with sophomore John Navarro, who could barely complete a pass. Those were with true freshman Chad Henney. Uh, Braylon Edwards had three straight thousand-yard receive re receptions, and will have more receiving yards in his senior year than Donovan Peoples-Jones in his probably his entire career in Michigan, no matter who the quarterback was. So I don't necessarily believe that if you went back in time and grabbed 2004 Braylon Edwards, put him on today's team, there's no way in hell he would have 300 yards receiving and 20 catches this late in the season. So I think it's a little bit of both, but those guys better return next year or potentially, which are the rumors out there, maybe look for another spot because I don't think any of them are – pro-level quality receivers, or at least have proven it, maybe talented enough, but certainly haven't proven it at this point. Come back, put up better stats, things go better, maybe, but who will be of those three guys? DPJ, Nico Collins, Tariq Black, uh, all draft eligible this year, whether it's this year or next, who will be the highest draft pick when they are selected? Comment below. I'm going to say Donovan Peoples-Jones just because I think He'll be the guy who probably tests out better at the combine and as such will uh, will get the bump. But I don't think either one of them, any of the three, will go in the first round. Question coming up from Tommy Clark at Tommy underscore 1432. This is the question I was talking about. You say the wide receivers are underperforming, but you not realize that Shea can't get them the ball. I don't necessarily think that's true, right? I think when Shea gets the opportunity, they go deep Nico Collins. Nico catches it. I'll give him that. But I watched so much Shea Patterson film a year and a half ago when he was, you know, coming to Michigan from Ole Miss, from his time in Ole Miss, from the Elite 11 camp when he was 17 years old. He can make the throws. I don't know if it's the offensive play calling, Coach Gaddis. I don't know if it's the wide receiver routes or they're not getting open or they're taking plays off. I don't understand what it is either, but I don't necessarily think it's only Shea Patterson. There's got to be a combination here, whether it's coaching, game plan, wide receivers, scheme, or Shea Patterson. But I've seen enough of Shea Patterson throughout the year to, to say that if you're going to say Shea can't get them the ball, I would say that is not accurate. But maybe he's you know not feeling comfortable in the pocket and, and, and you know a little bit behind nevertheless. But he can make all the throws. Question coming up from Sam Sellers. Thanks for the question. At Selman9 on Instagram. Could you imagine this year's team uh, if players would stop leaving early for the league? And... We were talking Michigan football fans historically, and maybe every college football program, has this uh, every year somebody will do it. It's either, can you believe, how, imagine how good we'd be if those two or three guys that went pro last year had come back for the senior year, or if that guy, like people used to say this about like Prescott Burgess and some random guys when Lloyd Carr would play a guy two snaps his freshman year, uh, but he'd lose his red shirt because, it, oh, if we only had him for his fifth year this year, the linebacking crew would be stacked. Uh, so both of those are interesting takes. But Michigan didn't really lose much compared to the other teams in the country. Let's just take a look at who lost the most players. Alabama, seven underclassmen to the pros. Can you imagine how good they'd be if those guys returned? That's a third of your starters would be returning. That means seven starters on potentially the number one team in the country next week after they beat Alabama or beat LSU down on Saturday. Um, that's a third of your starters would be back. That means a third of your starters would be backups this year. So. Think about that for a second. Ohio State, five. Um, imagine if Dwayne Haskins was your backup quarterback this year because he probably would be with Justin Fields playing like he would. I'm not sure if Fields would have transferred, but nevertheless. Oklahoma, the same, five. Florida, five. Georgia, Clemson, Iowa, four. And then Michigan lost three players, right? It could have been a lot worse. Imagine where Michigan would be if they went from three to seven. Imagine if Shea Patterson and, uh, you know, LaVert Hill – 
Liver Hill, Klee Hudson, and let's just say, for the sake of argument, who was another person that could have laughed? Liver Hill, Klee Hudson, Josh Metellus would have laughed. What would Michigan look like had they lost seven players? I don't think they would be anywhere as near as good as those teams. And we're talking about a seven and two team, not a nine and zero team. So nine and zero team. So I think you're gonna lose players every year. You're probably gonna lose one or two or three guys to the draft early every year if you're playing at a high level like Michigan's. You know, been playing near, but to say they would be that much better and other teams don't deal with it, I don't buy into that for a second. All right, thanks so much for watching the Michigan Football Report Instagram Q and A. Make sure you watch yesterday's Rumors Roundup. We've got our mid-season rumors and news video for you right here. And if you haven't yet, get us to 6,000 subscribers. Hit this button right here. Hit the button right here. Hit it. Hit it. Go blue.